Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious. This is Mark here, and I'm with a good person that I met recently. His name is Chris Fisher. He's the play-by-play announcer for the Oklahoma City Thunder. I met him through actually through a business connection, uh, but I heard his story, and I reached out to him because I found it to be so inspirational. And I'm always here to uh, try to lift people up and provide inspiration. So I thought I would ask him to come on. And he's so gracious to provide his time and share his time with us. Chris, are you there? I'm here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. I hear a little bit of the Oklahoma draw. Are you picking that up from the? No, don't say no. (laughs) Am I really? Do I sound? I'm a California kid. It can't (laughs) have that much influence in such a short amount of time. (laughs) How long have you been in it? Well, I've been out here. This is my third year doing Thunder basketball. And it's actually the longest that I've ever been out of California because the season has been so condensed going back to December when when it started in the preseason, even actually before that with November when we flew out here to, to get ready to go because it was such a short off season. But it's been five months and that's the longest I've ever been out of California at one time. Wow. So um going to be heading, going back here pretty soon but it uh with the season coming to a close but um it's kind of been kind of crazy when you think about it like that. Yeah, it's crazy it has has kind of covid played into that whole time being away with separation and everything out just out of precaution or usually we'll it, it, built into the schedule there's always trips out to California. And that's actually an interesting question because this is the first time that us broadcasters and the travel party are not traveling with the team. Usually we do. And usually we are on the team flight. We're staying at the team hotel on the team buses. We're on the exact same schedule as the players, the coaches, but because of COVID and I'm I'm sure that people have kind of noticed this, we've been grounded completely. And this goes back to even when the NBA went to the bubble in Orlando, we didn't go to the bubble in Orlando with the team. And we right. They had them. an announcer per, right? They had them kind of pre-scheduled. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we still called the games. We still broadcast the games, but we did them remotely from Oklahoma City, literally inside the arena on center court. Wow. How is that as a challenge? That must have been an interesting challenge for you. Something it, never was, before. it was definitely a unique experience because you're you're obviously disconnected and you are watching the game on a monitor on a big screen much like the fans are at home. We're, we're literally watching the exact same feed. And the difference is, though, as soon as I put that headset on, I'm getting the natural sound from the arena that's getting pumped into the arena and the players can hear it and some of those other microphones. And so that's getting pumped back into my headset. So you're actually getting those the faux cheering? pieces or are you just getting like the squeaky the shoes and the quiet getting the faux cheering getting the fake crowd noise getting whatever ambient microphones are out there we're getting that i don't have any control over the levels of it but we're getting it fed back into my headset right and you also don't have control over the way the person kind of feels the game's going to play the certain sounds Oh, I've absolutely that right? is above my pay grade. Totally. Completely. Well, that's what I'm saying. That must that must influence your kind of emotions, right? When you hear like a cheer, when it kind of looks like some kind of call the other way or something. Well, that's that's exactly it. I mean, we're, we're obviously reacting as, as to what's going on on the court from what we're watching on the monitor. But it's so it's so crazy because you'll hear this all of a sudden loud jolt of cheering. And I'm like, well, maybe they're just kind of playing around with the with the sound that it, it doesn't belong. Right. Sometimes they'll crank it up really high. Sometimes there's nothing. But in the essence of it is that as soon as I put that headset on and start to hear a little bit of that ambient noise, I can kind of go in the zone. And everything else that's going on around me, even though I'm in this completely silent, quiet arena, as long as I've got that headset on, as long as I'm hearing a little bit of that fake crowd noise, I can kind of get in the zone and go into a different place and call the game as if I'm there or do my best. And it's gotten so good now that the majority of the fans probably that are watching probably can't tell you the difference between me being there and me not being there because the technology has gotten so good. And the people behind the scenes that put the feeds together and all the audio, they do such a good job that I don't think the people at home have any clue. 
Right. There's so many technical challenges, like syncing up the video with the audio from different feeds and then merging them and then getting them into one signal. Right. Oh, it's It's got to be unbelievable. Yeah. So beyond me, but they do a great job because it's, it's gotten advanced. It's gotten really advanced. But anyways, I I haven't traveled going back to the original point. I haven't traveled at any point during the season and every single game that we've called this year on the Oklahoma city feed here has been from Oklahoma city, which is kind of crazy. Wow. Yeah. So, so you are the uh, play-by-play announcer. You said now going on three years, right? Um, like I said, I heard your story of like kind of your history, where you came from. I understand you are a California guy, uh, went to school there and then you had some challenges in your life. Would you care to share a little bit about some of your challenges and how you got through them? Uh, I just found your story so inspirational. Yeah, it's you kind of got to hit the the rewind button a little bit, and it, it's starting to get further and further in the rearview mirror. Um, but that's a good thing in a, its own healthy way, right? As long it, as it's it, done it in its a, own healthy way. I mean, but, yeah, as but maybe we can record it for posterity's sake for you. <laughs> so I'll, you know, you'll have a copy of this for you. It is kind of crazy because it it seems to be getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror as as you get older and your experiences change and you you know you you come across different people in your your professional career but when i was 17 years old which was now i'm 36 so uh we're coming up on a few years i was in high school and just really just like any other 17 year old high school kid junior with all the distractions in the world i mean i'm I'm, we're talking just trying to chase girls looking for the next party. All I want to do is be with my friends and look for another good time. And just one random night, actually it wasn't too random. It was the night before homecoming. Um, I was driving back from a good friend of mine's house out on a country road. It was three of us. I was in the front seat. There was a friend of mine in the back seat and then there was a driver of a car and, and he was driving too fast, no drugs, no alcohol. I was in the front seat and really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to what the driver was doing. I was looking through a book of CDs at the time and trying to find the next cool song to play. And as I'm looking through this book of CDs, I look up and the driver is going into this left turn and he was going way too fast. And the car lost control and he flipped the car basically into a ditch. And in the process, me being in the front seat, the car kind of rolled onto me and the the top of the roof collapsed and um, essentially collapsed onto my head and and my neck snapped and I broke my neck at C5, C6. And my spinal cord was totally, completely compressed. And I was totally paralyzed from the neck down and woke up in that moment and just total shock and not really sure what was going on. It took me a couple of minutes to realize that I was paralyzed. Uh, Cause at first, my first thought was my, my goodness, you know, we got in this car accident. We're going to have to tell our parents. Right. It's 17 that, you know, you, we, we got into a, a little bit of a problem here and your parents are going to be disappointed and there's going to be consequences. And that was my first thought. It wasn't, Oh my God, you know, I can't move my arms, and my legs and this excruciating pain that I'm in. And, um, but then it did set in that this was the reality and, and I was stuck there. So it, um, it ended up being a little while before the, the responders got there, but they did get me out and um, I, they flew me to the hospital that night and I ended up having surgery. And um, it seemed like from that point forward, I, I got a lot of really, really, really good fortune that sort of fell my way in my recovery that allowed me to to get back on my feet. And I'm making a long story short here, but ultimately I got back on my feet after that spinal cord injury, after being paralyzed for seven months. Seven after, months. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It was uh it was quite a quite a, a wild ride. And my poor parents, I mean, my parents, if for anybody that has kids, I mean, if anything goes wrong, I mean, you're, you're, you're obviously worried and you're concerned and you're trying to, to find them the best help and to get them whatever care they need. But this is just like a nightmare coming to life for them. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine what they were going through that night, my poor parents and sort of the, the reality of what they were about to face. 
and uh, they were just amazing. And um, seven months in, in not seven months in the hospital, I was in the hospital for about two and a half months and in intensive care. And then I was um, not only in intensive care, but I was also an inpatient at a hospital down in Santa Clara, California, which was a spinal cord rehab facility. And basically just had to relearn how to live, had to relearn how to live in this new body that wouldn't function the way that normal people would function. I mean, we're talking everything from brushing my teeth to getting myself fed to getting dressed to getting out of bed to learning how to live in a wheelchair to getting um, into the wheelchair. Um, I mean, it was it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal because you you have a physical therapist that's trying to get you to, to learn how to utilize whatever muscle it is that you have in this body that has obviously been diminished physically. And then you've got an occupational therapist that is really trying to get you to, <laughs> to learn how to function in daily life. And that's like using this new adaptive device to help brush your teeth or to take your meds or to drink a bottle of water or to make sure that you use the straw or trying to put your sock on in some way. I couldn't put my sock on at the time, but it, it, progressively you got there and it was just, um, it's little triumphs, right? It, Become yeah. Oh these my God. Huge, you have no like, idea. I, I don't, I don't want to equate it to like a Mount Everest moment moment, but it, it's one of those, like, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's, it was crazy. And one of those columns, many of them came, but one of them was when I could start to move my thumb. And this was about a month after I got hurt and I was in the hospital and it was around, I got hurt in October and it was around Thanksgiving and I could start to move my thumb and everybody was like, Oh my gosh, that's a huge deal. Big deal. Cause I couldn't move my hands at the time. And it was a sign that some signal was getting from my brain through the injury site down my spinal cord to uh, an area where it, it shouldn't. And so that was a really big moment. Right. That's and a huge it, moment. Was that the first, was that the first one or did you have a sensation of touch? Do you remember the first time after the, uh, the incident? No, that, I remember that that. I, so the first, it, it, the first movement came after the first sensation and to be, completely candid, Mark. The, the crazy thing about it was being 17, I was so young. I was so naive. I didn't know the extent of my injury. I didn't know how significant it was. I didn't know that 99% of the people that suffer my same injury are sent to a fate that is unfair. And they're stuck in a wheelchair and they're, they're motionless and they can't move and they can't feel from their neck down yeah, from their chest down. And in my mind, I didn't really comprehend that number one. And I didn't believe that it was going to be me number two. So time went on. Well, not, not a whole lot of time. I was still in, in ICU and my sister, one of my sisters was just kind of messing around with my feet and kind of grabbing my toes and just just being an older sister and just trying to prod me and annoy me more than anything. And right. I was, she said, can you feel that? And I was just kind of like, yeah, I can. What's the big deal? And everybody just kind of like lost it. Like, wait, oh, you wow. can feel that? I was like, yeah, I can feel it. What's the big deal? Of course I can feel it. And um, they, so in, in an interesting way, being so young at, when this happened to you kind of gate, was it almost like a false bravado? Cause like I, I could understand spirits being down and, and overcoming, right. And kind of having those depressive moments or those sad moments where you have to pull too yourself young. through. I was too young. And I, I, I mean, I was really frustrated the first night and the first night I, I got kind of upset and sort of realized, Hey, I can't move. This is probably kind of serious. And I, I was able to have some conversations with my family and um, kind of settle me down in the moment. And I ended up having surgery that night and I was out of it for a few days, but uh, it, it never, I don't think that the severity ever really quite set in. And because of that, I being 17 and being young and being naive, always thought that I was going to get back on my feet. Hundred yeah. percent. I, I, awesome. I, I always had a 
kind of an athletic mentality that, um, that I, I would sort of find my way back on my feet. And, and, um, and, you know, you just had these little moments where, and fate was kind. (laughs) It it literally comes down to that, Mark. I, I mean, I have no legitimate explanation as to why I was more fortunate than other people. I was relentlessly positive through the whole process. I know that. I, I think that's it. I think that's a huge, I mean, the men, the body follows the mind in a lot of ways. So it, it probably did. It probably did because uh, I just remember being weirdly in a good mood every single day and happy. And I was so, so fortunate that, you know, being at 17 and, and at that time I went to a high school, it wasn't too big, but it was a, it was a high school that, had a tremendously strong community feel and I had a lot of really close friends and I was really close with their families and this community really rallied for me in a lot of ways. And I think that uh, I rallied around that and they rallied around me and my family. And I I didn't see anything that was going on on the outside. And that was probably good because I think that there were probably a lot of tears and a lot of concern from, from family and friends that never seemed to trickle back in to the hospital and that allowed me to, to really stay in a good mood. And I just, I had so much support from everybody that had ever come across and, and across my path and just the, the cards, the calling, the support, the, the love, um, the visits. I mean, it was, it was daily, daily. So I think that was awesome. Way. I really think yeah, I mean, a long way. And there, and there were other people that didn't, I mean, I was in, I was in an ICU room not an ICU room, but when I got discharged from the ICU room and I went down to rehab, I had two roommates at the time. And one of them was a young man who lived in a poor neighborhood in the Bay Area and got shot in a drive-by. And the bullet nicked his spinal cord. And he didn't have people coming into the hospital every single day. Yeah. And, you know, I look back on it now and I'm just like, man, boy, that, that poor guy, that poor kid, I wish I could go back and, and do it, do more for him. And the guy, another older man was run off the road driving. He was, he was, uh, somebody that had some affiliation with a gang, I think. And somebody ran him off the road and he ran into the median and he was in a car accident too. And it damaged his spinal cord. So, um, and they didn't have the same kind of support and people coming to visit them every single day. So I think that that played just a a huge factor in my mindset, which had to have played a role in the the process of healing my body in some way. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, it sounds, sounds like it's a, it's a nod to the community that you grew up in and and the people that you surrounded yourself with big time growing up big time. Yeah. I, I'm, I could never, I'm still close with a lot of people. You can't, you can't give up on those kind of people that, yeah. that were there for you in your, your lowest time. So. so it was a little bit more of a rural area in California then that you grew up. I wouldn't call it rural. Not, it was, not just rural less, it was less Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, it's definitely not <laughs> Southern California. I mean, Southern California right. is, is a, is a world within itself. I mean, Southern California, Northern California, if, for people that have been there, it's not the same. By any yeah. I mean, it's a different state. It's so dense. It's so heavily populated. The Bay Area is populated too, but in a different way. You're just yeah, for sure. you're really not on top of each other the same way. But it was in a, a, a part of Northern California, just north of San Francisco. I'm sure people would be familiar with it. Sonoma County and um, Santa Rosa and kind of right there on the edge of the wine country a little bit. So okay. um, I had uh, friends in Hollister and Gilroy. Or the, that's a little right. further south. That's south. Okay, it's a little more um, south. Okay. Yeah, that's in the. Yeah. In, I'll uh, be honest. I'm from Philadelphia. I know nothing about California. I it's it's naivety. I will admit it. Nothing about yeah. it. So you don't go visit or anything. Uh, like that? I, oh, I like. I mean, I've driven to San Diego and Los Angeles. I've driven places before, flown places, but it's just one of those things. I've been to San Jose. Went to a couple of Sharks games and whatnot. But oh, um, yeah, that's right. yeah, fun stuff. Yeah, that's dipping a toe, Mark. That's not. Really it is dipping a toe. It's true. But uh, so. So you had this community, you come, you grow up in this community and now you move out to Oklahoma city, which, you know, when you think Oklahoma city, you'd think kind of salt of the earth community type town. Is that kind of the, 
the city well, you're, that you're in? You're skipping a lot of years there. But oh boy! <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's go through them. What what no, else? What, I mean, uh, it's, I, yeah, I, share with us. <laughs> No, I'm here for you. So I've got all day. I'd love to hear your story. I'm really, I'm really inspired by it because I had a, a car accident at 13. I just broke just above my femur. So but just what you Femur's went through, the biggest bone in the body. Yeah. What, what you went through just sounds, just sound what I, you know, just from what I heard and then the stories I read or the, the articles I read, I was just, just inspired. And it sounds like you just had this really amazing community that kept you in good spirits. And that had to have really aided in that, in that recovery process. Well, there are, there are times when you, you sort of look back and you, you say to yourself, boy, how could I possibly, you know, go back and try to repay these people that were there for me? And, and a lot of them are still my good friends and, and they played a, a pivotal role, but, you know, I've always tried to, to go back and, and say thank you and to keep in touch with the people that were there, which is really hard, the older you get. And, and as your career is going different, as my career is, has gone where it has and being out of California and um, not sort of having the same connection. And, you know, when, when you go to high school, you, you think that those are going to be the, your friends forever. And a lot of them you lose touch with, but um, I'm still very good friends with a lot of the people that were there during those years. And as you know, I'm, I'm you got your boys. Yeah, absolutely. They they made so much fun of me, <laughs> uh, which too, you know, kind of kept kept me grounded. And I had a this purple wheelchair, and oh, that, that's like a hot rod wheelchair. Yeah, it was a hot rod wheelchair, and it had rubber bands on the side, so I had so I could grip it and stuff like that. And they they were constantly making fun of me, so <laughs> it was good, and it kept you grounded. And they still do today, you know. They they awesome. still do today, so it's great. But um, you know, going from Going from the Bay Area, I was I was fortunate that uh, I was able to to get back as a lot of independence, a, a, a lot of independence to where I, I walk now, and I, I it's with a cane, and I've got a little bit of a, a limp with with my left side being weaker than my right side, and that's okay. Um, I'm you said, I mean, you're still athletic. I mean, you still play play some activities, recreational sports, and whatnot, right? Mark, I cannot play enough golf. It's there terrible. you go. It's terrible. How many, how many holes, how many holes a month, sir? Come on. Well, it, de <laughs> it, it depends. It depends in, in what time of the year it is because it does get a little chilly out here. The, the course is freeze over and I don't, I, this body doesn't like the cold anymore. It's very, very sensitive. Get me out to Arizona where you're at. And I'll, Come on out. I, high, uh, high pressure all the time, my friend. Oh gosh. It's so nice. It's so nice. But, um, I'll get out there. I'll, I'll play. I, during the summertime, boy, as much as possible, there's a lot of muni courses out here in Oklahoma, which are really easy to get on. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, get, getting out, getting moving. Um, I will say this. The crazy part about it is I can, you can, if I golf, you can pretty much tell that I can, I, I've had an injury. If I go out and ski, because skiing, I loved to ski before I got hurt. The, the craziest thing is I am a better skier now than I am a walker. Huh. I can ski the exact same way now that I did before I got hurt. Wow. I turn the same way. I have the same exact feel. I haven't lost the ability. It's the craziest thing in the world, Mark. I will go. Wow. And I will ski. When did, what was your first time on skis? How long have you, how long has this been a passion? <sighs> Is this your since like a uh, baby? Since I was toddler? three, probably. Oh, it's amazing. My 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 dad always always brought us up to to the snow in Tahoe, and my two older sisters, and he he was always pushing us to get out there to try things to challenge ourselves, and <laughs> I'm sure it was hard as hell on him because I was probably a pain in the ass a lot when I was younger. <laughs> and push back a lot and probably had a little bit of attitude, but we constantly went to, to go skiing and it was always like, Hey, let's go to the snow. If you want to go skiing, let's go. And we, he'd pack us up and go and, and we had a little spot and that's, I loved it. And I did it all th throughout my entire childhood up until I was 16. I didn't get to the ski season of when I was 17. Cause it was, my accident was in October, but I got pretty good. And and it never went away. It was like riding a bike. 
I yeah. could when, not believe it. How often do you get to go now? I would assume it'd be a little more challenging. There's not too many mountains or I haven't or, been in three years. Okay. But, we got to get you back. Okay. No, it's, yeah, it's, been a, thing. It, it's been a little tough with the NBA schedule just because of you just can't with the games and they don't have too sure. many hills here in Oklahoma. Um, but before I was going, I'd go and spend a week in, in Utah and go and ski snowbird and just get after it. Uh, Mammoth, I had a buddy that was living with me at the time and we would go and ski Mammoth uh, as much as possible. And you would, it, it's just, it's the ultimate freedom of getting out into the, into the outdoors and feeling the wind and getting on the mountain and the crisp air. You just can't put a price on that. And it's the, it's the most normal that I will ever feel. I think oh, that's cool. in my body now is being on the slopes and, and getting on a chairlift and well, you definitely have to get back to that for sure. Then, you know, you don't want to ever lose that. But it, it clearly didn't go away the first time. <laughs> well, I just mean the matter. You just don't want to lose the freedom of it, the feeling, because you don't, no. you know, you haven't done it in a couple of years. No, so, few no, years. I got to get back. I got to get back out there. And it's, it's calling me. I mean, every single, every single winter time, I got my buddies that are like, man, we just had the greatest day at Kirkwood. Oh my God. You know, it's four feet of powder. Wish you're out here. I'm like, yeah, great. I don't know. I'm from the East coast. We had four feet of ice. They, they call they're it blue powder ice. out there. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm very familiar. <laughs> We're the, we, make, uh, we make we make shaved we make shaved ice uh, snow cones and everything. It's beautiful. Yeah, but if you can learn how to ski out there, you can learn how to ski anywhere. It's so bad. Yeah, it is bad, but we it's not the knee high powder either. So it's a totally different kind of muscle use. You know, true. <laughs> true. you're not carving. You're kind of trying to stay probably you're relaxed. You're not fine. fighting you're, it. You're surviving. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white knuckled, right? Gosh, might as well put ice skates on. <laughs> so d- growing up, did you play any other sports? Uh, I just, it was, it was casual. It was casual. casual. Um, okay. Snow skiing was, was always number one. Golf, golf came a little bit later. Um, soccer played a ton of soccer. And then, you, you know, you have your other sort of ancillary sports to, to just play with your boys or whatever, whatever time of the season it is. You know, hey, do you want to go play basketball? Yeah, I only play basketball. Yeah, down the street, pavement hockey and. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Most yeah. my most of my crew in high school played basketball, and so I'd go and play basketball with them. I couldn't imagine. You know what's crazy, Mark? I, I couldn't imagine playing one sport year round. Everybody plays like one sport. They 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 finally they get to the point where they want to take a sport seriously because they probably want to go and get a scholarship somewhere. How do people play one sport year round? I yeah, I don't do get it. it. Well, I mean, I guess off season a lot of, like a lot of pitchers have like pitchers, hockey players have golf, right? So they break it up a little bit. But to your point, I I couldn't do it. It's I, it's 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 just it's not diverse enough for me. No you know, wonder, like a pitcher, a pitcher throws the ball. I know you have different grips and everything, but like that's kind of what a pitcher does is catch the ball and throw the ball. But I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> imagine being in eighth grade and saying, you know what, I am going to commit to one sport all throughout the rest of my youth because it's this is my ticket to getting a college scholarship or this yeah. is my ticket to getting drafted or this is my ticket to because I have to do it because I have to compete with my peers because if I don't they're going to surpass me and I'm like your body's going to break down yeah that, there is definitely the overuse right using the same muscles and the same uh, movement and everything. Interesting story. I remember when I was at USC, which is where I went to college, Pete Carroll would always talk about the guys that he would want to recruit. And he would always ask recruits, do you play multiple sports? And that was always a high priority for him. Do you play multiple sports? Yes. No. Did you play basketball in high school? Did you play these other sports? Cause he always felt like it was better for balance and, and for, for just your body and, and your competitiveness and, sort of your curiosity in your mind of going out and playing different sports. So I always thought that was really interesting. Yeah. It does change the IQ because you do see from different perspectives, you know, playing multiple sports. So it is neat uh, to your point, but like when you, when you want to get great at something, you have to focus, you have to just really refine into one. And, and there is that mental, I don't know if it's a toughness or just an ability. Maybe it's a support system as well. People helping encourage you stay focused on one to get you through it. Well, I mean, there comes a point for these kids when they're younger, they, they have to probably face a decision. They feel pressure to go and to commit to a sport 
because that's the sport that they're best at. And that's the sport that they feel like is their ticket. And so they'll commit to it. I, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I, I think that, that the more balanced you are, the better. I think it's going to serve you better in the long run. I think it's going to serve your body better in the long run, but I'm no sports scientist. I'm no expert. I just know that when I was younger, having that sort of breakup of, Hey, you know, you're going to play soccer in the fall. You're going to ski in the winter time. You're going to play golf in the spring and the summer. That to me was a really fun way to keep my body healthy, to keep my, my friendships different to, um, to, to sort of just mix things up. Yeah. I, I don't know. That That's how it was when I was a kid, but it, I'm only hearing this because it just seems like more and more kids these days are, are committed. specializing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think, I think specializing is right. I think what happens is too, it depends on where it is, right? You've got some areas that are specialized for like military and like trying to get out via athletics. Right. So a lot of the options, the options aren't seen bigger than like one or two options. Well, you I guess I mean? if you played, if you grew up in where you grew up to probably has a big part to do with it. If you grew up in Minnesota, you're going to play hockey. Yeah, I, that too, for sure. If you grow up in Arizona, you're probably going to play golf, baseball. Right. Um, well, I'm just saying like, say you're in a, in a place that there are not many options to get better in the, in the world. Right. It's an area that's just not supported in that way. What do you mean? Uh, like an inner city, for example, right. To get oh, out, right. to get out. Right. So a lot of people use sports to get out. hundred percent. So we, if you don't see those options outside of sports or the military or something pretty myopic, you don't, it's not that those options aren't there or not there. You just don't see them. So you just can't filter, you know, to see them. And then you kind of specialize into that niche. Yeah. Without a doubt. It, it, sometimes you just get funneled in that direction because yeah. that's, that's sort of what your, your economics say. It's what your geography says. Yeah. Um, there are definitely circumstances. And there, and we've, I've heard of, you know, the industry, the, the different situations, and I'm, I'm not here to get political or get anything in its specific organizations, but, uh, you know, people take advantage of it, right? Like Don King took advantage of Mike Tyson as a boxer. Well, once, got, the, once they know. get to that level. Right. Co coach is taking care of. Yeah. In high school though, you've got the coach level, right. That kind of gets you funneled into a, you know, this group that gets you noticed to move up right within that. That is a whole know, nother bag of, right. I'm of, trying, of, I'm trying to, I'm trying to tiptoe around it. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. That's, that's a whole bag. I'd, of, I'd be way too out, outside of my breadth and depth to talk about that this moment. So, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So you, you went to USC. So did, how long did you go right out of, did you graduate high school on time at 18 or, or 17 or whatever? Or? So, yeah, the way that it broke down was I, I got really lucky that <laughs> crazily enough, based off of when my injury occurred within the school schedule, I ended up missing about, I want to say like a quarter and a half of school okay. when I was in the hospital and there I was not going back full time. But by the time I got back into my wheelchair and discharged from the hospital, we're talking two and a half months after the injury, but I was very much still in a wheelchair and limited during that time. I was still able to go to school, not full time, right. a couple of classes, yeah. just enough to, to kind of stay involved, to, to learn, to, to take the proper tests. <laughs> I couldn't even write. People had to write for me. Wow. So, um, and the school was incredibly accommodating and was, was worked with me and worked with my schedule. It was reduced. I think I took like three or four classes. I still was going through really, really intense therapy at the time. And my junior year, I ended up just kind of earning enough credits my junior year of high school. And then by the time that I went back my senior year, um, my senior year of high school, I was walking and okay. was ready for a full schedule again. So I had just enough credits 
and I had all the prerequisites taken care of. And by that point, Mark, I knew what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. That was that was <laughs> the good thing about it. And the crazy thing is that junior year, my junior year of high school, I took a trig class, trigonometry, and I've never taken another math class since. <laughs> so you knew what you didn't want to do. How did you figure out what you did want to do? Well, I think that it, it came down to, it's actually an evolution. I, I Just like everybody else, when you're, you're young and, and you're passionate about your sports teams, I love sports. We played sports. I consider myself an athlete. I knew I wanted to be involved in sports. And when I couldn't play anymore, I had to find a way to, to kind of get that competitive fire out. And so my gravitation toward it all just intensified. And at that point, the San Francisco Giants were really, really good. They had Barry Bonds, who in 2001 yeah. broke the, the home run record of, of Mark McGuire at 73 home runs. And then the very next year, they ended up going to the, to the World Series and lost game seven. And, and I was just so in touch and enamored and glued to this whole experience. And the, the Niners had had great teams over the years with, with Jerry Rice and, and Steve Young. And they won the Super Bowl in 94. And that had such an impact in, in my youth. So and I'm, I'm a, I'm a little bit older than you. So I remember the nineties, even, uh, the know, 80s, you mean 94, with, you know, we're talking yeah. with Montana, the four with Montana. So of course. I, I remember those. Yeah. So, I mean, those, those were such a big deal. And it's the reason why the Niners are the most popular team in the Bay area by a wide margin because of, of those incredible years in the eighties when they, they won four Super Bowls. But I just, I was so locked in and, that love only exponentially got greater. And I was like, I have got to be a part of this somehow. There's, there's just no way around it. I'm not going to be passionate about anything else. And when I was in college, um, I just started to, to kind of figure out, well, how, how am I going to get this done? And I, if anybody that knows me back in the day, I would not shut up. I would not stop talking. And so I resemble that remark. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wouldn't shut up. And I just figured, you know what, maybe I'll just get into to sports commentary somehow and figure out a way to do it. I had no idea if I had a good voice. I had no idea if I could be a broadcaster, if it was going to be play by play, or you want to do studio hosting. Um, you know, you want to do radio. Do you want to do TV? No idea. But I liked yapping and I liked being competitive and I liked talking a lot of shit. So, um, Whatever people wanted to get after it, I would get after it, and, and that would and that would have been big time Sports Center heyday at that time. I would oh, think. huge! I mean, so you've got your Dan Patrick's and your and your uh, o Oberman back in the day, and are just yucking it up. I mean, they are. And it's it was a great to show back. Stuart Scott, Rick yep, Eisen, Stuart, Larry sure Field. Eisen for sure. Um, That's Scott Van Pelt, everybody. Scott Van Pelt, like things things were taken off. I mean, it, yeah. it was just. Sports Center was only growing things more uh, and more. And and it had the market cornered at that time. It didn't even have competition. So it was just crushing it for a few years. There. Totally. Totally. And um, and so I ended up going when I went to USC, um, I <laughs> I remember going to my first USC football game and going to the Coliseum, and this was 2004 with Matt Leinart and Reggie Bush, and they'd, they'd come off their national championship season. The yeah, we know Matt Leinart in Arizona. Yeah, we, we know. Yeah. <laughs> he, he took down ASU <laughs> in, in Arizona a couple times. No, I just mean he he joined the Cardinals and was – Oh, oh, because of yeah, uh, the Arizona Cardinals. Yes. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was not the, the most successful stint. I but. threw almost as many passes, I think. I'm not sure. Almost. Well, I remember, <laughs> I remember going into the Coliseum and – it was so big and I was so overwhelmed that I, I was like, how in the world can I get involved in this? What do I got to do? And it was intimidating. It was really, really intimidating at first. And I went throughout that entire fall. I'm just kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. And I finally just said, you know what? I'm going to email the sports information director and see what, 
what might be available. And at that point, I hadn't even pursued the student radio station or whatnot. But the sports information director at the time, and he's still a sports information director, his name is Tim Tesselon, emailed me back and he said, hey, I'm going to get you in touch with the people at KSCR, which is the, the student-run radio station. And Kevin Shaw was his name. He was the sports director. And Kevin Shaw said, hey, come out, meet everybody. You know, it's a little late in the season, but um, – you know, it'll, it'll be good to familiarize yourself with everybody and, 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 you know, maybe, maybe line something up for next year. Yeah. Hit the ground running, right? Hit the ground running. Exactly. And they threw me on a couple of radio shows at the end of the season and, uh, did a couple of updates and you know, we're treating it like it's, you know, ESPN radio and, uh, trying to, trying to make it as professional as possible. And then going into that next season, my my second year at USC, they they won the national championship that year, and and then there was a new sports director, and his name was Dan Page, a very good friend of mine still, and we started calling the football games on the student radio station, and that's that's kind of how it got going, and we traveled and we called the games from the Coliseum, and that was it. I was like, this is what I'm doing, and. Very nice. I was very, and I will say this, if anybody, if any young person out there is, is listening, if you can figure out what you're doing, and this is not to put any pressure on anybody, but sooner in life, the quicker you can figure out what you want to do, the better, because I'll never forget being able to just in my mind say, I am going to throw all my chips on the table here and pursue this professionally. Cause I know that there's nothing else that I'm going to want to do. There's nothing else I'm going to want to invest my time in that I'm going to feel like I'm going to get the same return. And I think that's even the bigger message, right? Is like finding that you have, you can merge your passion and your, and your career. And it's a lot, it's a lot harder to do. I mean, it is the choices that everyone has nowadays is crippling. You can do anything you want to do. I mean, seriously, pick anything and go, right? Well, like, I that, mean, start it, right? But you can do it at home now. Yeah. You don't even have to be in the office to do it because of yeah. technology and how far advanced we are in our telecommunications. It's just incredible. And you don't even have to be at a sporting event, going back to what we were talking about earlier, to call a game. I have a really strong suspicion that in like 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to do, it's going to be like bubble. It'll be teams representing cities, but it'll be one location or one like little sports complex. It'll eliminate travel and everything will be like, you know, the, the camera angles are so good nowadays. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is way down the road. I mean, I'm not, I'm it's, I don't think it's really predictive. It's just more evolutionary. I mean, that's just the direction it seems to be going. You know? Who knows? I mean, it, it, it could get there. I mean, you, you're probably going to be able to punch in on your TV, you know, whatever game you want to watch and in any given sport and anywhere in the world, and you're going to have access to it. Yeah. And esports. And look at these esports just t make, taking off like crazy now. I mean, kids aren't getting hurt. They might get a little carpal tunnel with the joy with the game controller, but <laughs> esports is unbelievable. They, they yeah. rent out these NFL stadiums and we'll have these drone races or something, whatever they are. And I'm like, what the drone racing league? I've seen that. I am. I can't even follow it. It is amazing, but I will put it on. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Billion dollar industry, billion dollar industry, but and growing and it's, just growing. It's so beyond me. I, I, I just, it's amazing how quickly things are changing. So whenever anybody asks me like, you know, what, what advice would you give? I, I would say just start doing whatever it is you want to do from home. And you, because you can do it, there's ways to do it. And um, you don't have to be, you know, in a, in a, in a packed arena to call a game. Yeah. You just don't. So, so try to give yourself as much experience as possible. And I think that's such good advice. And it is, it is just more and more challenging with the increase in choices. You know, it really, it really does change. It change is. A little bit. It is because there, there's, there's a million different avenues. I mean, there's, there's jobs that, right now did not exist when I was starting out because of what maybe it's like social media yeah. or the, the progression of the internet. And the one that cracks me up right now, do you remember when journalists were fact checkers? 
that that was like kind of the job of the journalist was to fact check. It's kind of in like in the job description. Well, now they have a job called fact checkers. I'm on Twitter and it's like journalist or fact checker confirms journalist story. And you're like, isn't that the journalist job to, do right. its own, to confirm its own story? It's true. It's really weird. So like to your point, all these niche openings of just different avenues of, of doing things. It, uh, exist. Um, it's good. It's good. It's giving for sure a lot more opportunities. No doubt. Yeah. And there's a lot smarter people now. I, I, like I couldn't, I'm so rudimentary in, in sort of my technology skills. I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, I, I'm like a one trick pony here with throw me a headset because I've been training myself over these years to do that, that all these new jobs that have evolved, I, I couldn't even begin to try to tell you how to do them or to, to, to break into them um, other than more of more of these sort of big concepts of, you know, try to try to do something and, and figure out if you like it or not and, and try to do it from home and try to get yourself a little bit of experience and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, Absolutely. it's just, um, it's just wild how quickly things have advanced, but yeah, for sure. And, and so for you, so you come out of the radio station and then start doing the television for USC on campus, no, Is that a campus no. channel. So what happened? Well, so during the time at USC, speaking of technology, um, I became close with, at the time, the video director, video coordinator um, of USC Athletics. And right when, and this was just me sort of working my way into Heritage Hall, which was the athletic building at USC, because of the, the context that I had made just being a student and going to events and saying, hey, I need a credential, this and that. I wore them out. I was there all the time. That's awesome. And I built a lot of really good relationships with a lot of people that I'm still friends with today. But one of those was, was Rich Rodriguez and Rich was like, Hey, look, man, you know, USC Trojans.com is going to start putting these games on the internet, whether it was women's volleyball or a women's soccer update and my favorite men's baseball. And so me and Rich, we were tight and we would just go around sporting event to sporting event, to sporting event. And like, Hey, let's call this, let's do it. And he, cool. would, he would set up the camera and we would do the baseball game or we would do the women's soccer update or we do the women's volleyball game. And that was, that was it. So I, I got a lot of really, really valuable experience doing those events and they were on for sure. I mean, I didn't know anything about women's volleyball, but you, you, know, you, you <laughs> well, it's funny. It's a skill set. Totally. You know, for sure. Uh, this podcast we're on, I think your number episode 99, I think actually 98 or 99. And it's one of those things where if I listen to the first five, I am absolutely unlistenable. <laughs> right? uh, you Isn't know, some of the most true? important things I want to talk about, I have zero skill set and I, I was a singer in a cover band for a long time and I've done things like this, but it is still a different, it's still something new and you, it's a steep learning curve, but and, you get there. And you listen to yourself in this instance and you're probably like, man, I, that just does not sound good. Yes. It does yeah. not sound good. Can we erase that or can, can I redo it? I, yeah. The how one many, we did one. You wish you could redo well, my old co my my former co host was a USC nut nut job in a good way. He was just a fan. <laughs> um, that was his thing. Like he grew up in California, and USC was his just his school. And uh, we did something on the on like a Catholic church with a buddy of his had some stuff that happened there, and it was one of these really raw emotional things. And here I am saying real quick every two seconds. It's like hashtag real quick is like a T-shirt <laughs> I need to come up with because I'm saying real quick, real quick, jumping in, you know, not learning like the conversation to come to you. You know, the, the skill set of play by play, I can only imagine how intricate that is and how how much you practice that. So the interesting thing about play by play is it's a constant work in progress, no matter what. And, and this was my mindset back in college. Because to that point, when, you, when I would go back and I would listen to my early games, even when I was in college, 
I would just cringe. It was cringeworthy. What, what are you talking about? How could you possibly think that sounds good? What are you saying right now? Why aren't you getting your color analyst involved? Why is there so much dead air? And so then in a, in a lot of ways, you get a little overwhelmed. You're like, am I really supposed to be doing this? But my mindset was, look, this next broadcast, I am going to focus on one specific thing. And I kind of equate it to an artist sculpting a, a piece of clay. And let's say you're sculpting a piece of clay into a, a, a person's body. One day you got to work on the head. The next day you got to work on the legs. The next day you got to work on the body. And you, because you're not going to be able to do it all at once and you're not going to be able to do it all at one, in one broadcast. Yeah. It's like an overwhelming, it's like, like to your point, it's a job where you have that checklist. And for me, it was that it's um, remove the ums and the ands and the o's, right? And then it's remove the so, and then remove the real quick, and then remove this. And you work on each little piece and you hone it and refine it. Every single time. And, and every time. you will literally say to yourself, I don't care if I screw up everything else, but I am not going to do this one specific thing today. Right. Or I am going to do this one specific thing today. And I don't care if it affects everything else that happens in this broadcast, but I am going to make it a point. And if that's your mentality, I don't think it's a bad mentality. And no, not at all. Because. But that's a great, that's a great uh, piece and work in progress, right? Is like to, that's a great uh, tool to teach others is to focus on one thing and hone that and then m move on to the next, you know? It, it certainly helped me in a lot of different ways, it, but also along those lines, doing it consistently. And that's another factor where, where I put it in my head. Like I, I have to do this on a regular basis. And I knew that leaving college, I was by no means anything close to a finished product. And I, I, I didn't think that I was in a position where people would take me seriously still. And so my mindset was not to go into TV. My mindset leaving college and leaving USC was to get into baseball to get into minor league baseball, to get into radio, to get into radio. Okay. To get into so like radio. triple A, like triple so, A like that or what? Yeah. What so what of? happened was, is my first job was from the baseball winter meetings in Nashville, Tennessee in December of 07. I went out there, submitted my, my, my reel and my resume that I put together from doing the, the college baseball games with the mindset that I, that that's what I would do. Cause I needed Number one, to get better. I needed to get better as a broadcaster and doing radio every single day was, was my way of doing it. And I figured I'd go and move my way up and maybe get a major league baseball job. But two, it was also where I felt like all the opportunities were. You go and there was the, what was it called? It was uh, like a, a minor league baseball job fair okay. and professional baseball job fair, something, something like that. Yeah. And all these minor league teams would come and they'd post their jobs. And I felt like that was my best way to break into the industry. And somehow I snagged a job with a, a team in Woodbridge, Virginia. And I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was a fantastic experience. Look, Virginia's for lovers. It's perfect. It's good. Virginia, <laughs> just south of DC. And I mean, <laughs> Don't get me started on I-95 and the traffic. People get I am from Philadelphia, man. I, I live I-95. Mark, how do people live with themselves back there? Everyone gives it, L.A. a hard time. It Five is. lanes, bumper to bumper traffic, this and that. You know what? At least L.A. traffic moves. But yeah. you know, I-95 I does not move. Not, not a D.C. area for sure. Not in Baltimore over there. The Beltway <laughs> is a tight belt that doesn't move. Yeah. Yeah, and Philadelphia is just constant construction. We just drive into potholes, and it's it's a mess. Yeah, it's awful. I don't know how people like how do people do it. But anyways, that was my first experience. I, 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 trust me, the East Coast and West Coast. It's so funny that that like it is a hard. There's a hardness on the East, and there's a there's a there's just a different mentality on the West. It's like an easy. It, they both work, but they both are approached from totally different mindsets. Totally different mindsets, but. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget driving into DC and just being like, we are literally stuck. Yeah. DC is awful. I heard is hell. Absolutely. Tragic, tragic traffic. But 
it was a great experience because I was fresh out of college and it gave me an opportunity. It was advanced A was the level. It wasn't triple A or double A or anything. It was just single A and I was the number two, but they gave me an opportunity and I was the happiest clam you could possibly find because I was, I was in, I got my foot in the door. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. I'm going to work my way up and become a major league baseball broadcaster. And of course, you know, things change and you take left turns in your career and it doesn't end yeah. up that way. But the, the one thing that I remember from that experience is just how important it was to one, get the reps, which I was fortunate to get because it allowed me to make a lot of mistakes. And we need that ability to be able to make mistakes without the judgment side of that so many mistakes and that's not we need to, to freely that. make mistakes because we can only learn from them we we avoiding mistakes doesn't actually you don't learn from avoiding the mistake 100 you, just, you, you just, just delay causing it here's the best way to put it and this is this is how i learned my way around la put away your phone and don't look at at your google maps or whatever yes. is on your phone. Get lost. The Get only lost. way you're going to learn your way around a city or a neighborhood is to like make le- a million different wrong left turns. That's, That's how beautiful. I learned my way around LA. We didn't have iPhones back then. Yeah, if you hit the water, you're going too far. I mean, let's like, that's all you got to <laughs> do. Turn back around and go the other way. I mean. Exactly. Exactly. Or you end up on the wrong freeway. And yeah, but then you could be like judgment night situation where like, you know, the guys get caught in a bad neighborhood and they get a flat tire. And that could just be a bad thing. Well, in just USC, a bad movie we're, we're, we're always in a bad neighborhood. So, <laughs> so we, we feel comfortable in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> uh, um, so, but, so while you were doing the baseball stuff, yeah. uh, did, were you working also like full time doing so? Because I can only imagine it wouldn't, it doesn't sustain you, right? Or no, you're either taking on loads of debt or you're either working like, 92,000 hours a week, right? Uh, I was, I was fortunate to get some help. Definitely. Awesome. I was definitely fortunate to get a little bit of help from, from my parents and. Yeah. But that's, know, still, not, once again, it speaks to your community and, and the people that can help you out. And that's a beautiful thing. You recognize that and acknowledge that. Too. Without a doubt. I mean, nobody, nobody gets anywhere on by themselves. And, um, but they knew that I was taking it seriously and that this is what I wanted to do and that I was committed to it. And yeah, that I wasn't uh-huh. taking it lightly or like, hey, look, this is some joyride out on the East Coast. Yeah, you're not hanging out in Virginia. Right? Right. Let's not kid ourselves. Right? Virginia like, Beach <laughs> and then, you know, Jersey Shore and then by- Newport yeah. News. You want to be in Newport News? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Got to be a tough, tough area, right? Um, tough crowd. But uh, so the, how many years did you spend in Virginia with the, sing, with the um, minor league team? One year. Okay. One year. And um, one year because – they wanted me to sell billboards in the off season. And I remember this vividly thinking in my head, so I sell billboards in the off season, don't broadcast, spend the winter where it's freezing your toes off. <laughs> still bad traffic. Still regardless. bad traffic. And you're not going to yeah, at least you have bad traffic in good weather in LA. Right. But it, I mean, it just didn't equate to me. <laughs> Why yeah. would I do this? And so I basically just took a chance on myself and said, I'm going to go back to LA, find some broadcasting in LA, whatever that might be, just so that I continue to broadcast. And I'll take a chance on myself and I'll get another job next year whatever it might be doing, doing minor league baseball. And it was a really critical, critical decision that I made because I bet on myself with no guarantees that my career was going to continue, which I wanted it to continue in baseball. That was, to me, that was my path. That was my, my way of moving up. That was my way of building a career. Yep. And, yeah. So you put all, you kind of put all your eggs in the baseball basket in this, at this point. At this career, point. Right? Yes. After my okay. first year. And, and betting on yourself, always do that. That's another one, you know, a great piece of advice. It's tough. It, it feels scary and it feels uncertain, but you are the, the best control of your life. It, Bet it, on yourself. it just felt right. It just yeah. felt right to, to try to carve out 
a different pathway than the one of staying in Virginia and staying with the Nationals, staying with Potomac. For sure. It just felt right. And I packed up my car, put it on a truck, shipped it back to California, and I flew back and waited for it to arrive. And so at that point, it, maybe the the biggest, weirdest break I ever got was, I think in November of that off season, not, maybe even a little bit before, I think it was November. Rich Rodriguez, who I, I mentioned earlier from USC, yeah. who I was really close with, with the video department, calls me up and he says, Fish, hey, what do you, what do, you do you want to do women's basketball? Do you want to do USC women's basketball this year? And I'm, I'm like, and at that point, I'd been doing high school football in Southern California for my buddy who was starting up this company. And I, at first I said, Rich, no, I don't want to do women's basketball. What do you think? Come on, man. Why would I do right. women's basketball? And it was, yeah. it was so short-sighted. And I called him back probably a week later after thinking it over. And I thought it over. Why wouldn't I do it? It's USC. It's basketball. It's another sport. You diversify. You add it to your resume. Like, why wouldn't you do it? They're gonna, you're going to travel with the team. Great opportunity. Call him back and say, Rich, absolutely. I'll do it. And it was the first major left turn of my professional career because it changed my career for forever. Yeah. And at that there's a point, pivot is a pivot that you're not, you're not looking back, but you're I'm definitely locked into back. it. Well, <laughs> I, it's, it, it, it was something that I accepted, but during that season, during that, that one year of doing women's basketball, uh, mid season or maybe more toward the later part of the season, the men's basketball broadcaster, his name is Rory Marcus, rest in peace. Rory, who I was also very close with just through the years of, of being associated with, with the Trojans and USC, he passed away. And it was so sad because Rory was such a big part of, of USC men's basketball. He had done it for, I think, 11 years, and we loved him. He was a great guy. He also did the Anaheim Angels on the side, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I caught my first really, really big break of my career because after that season, they moved me over from women's basketball to men's basketball at 25 years old. And, That's and great that they realized that they had talent and at least at least potential, but certainly talent in currently in their group. A lot of times people look outside of the that immediate circle and it creates resentment and things like that. Well, they easily could have. There were plenty of people who gladly would have taken that job. A USC job? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. I'm pretty, so, pretty certain. Um, and I was 25 and a complete unknown and in a big market. And all of a sudden, um, you know, what is USC doing hiring this kid? And I was so raw still. So raw. But what year was, what year was that? 2010. Oh, I I wonder if like I know internet was kind of start social media was starting there. I wonder were they were they kind? Was anyone kind to you being so young? I mean, did there were definitely some ruffled feathers. Okay, I could totally see it because you've got you know conservative old guard of like old school USC people, right? And then you know you're what you 25 when you get this job? Is that correct? 25. That yeah. Oh my 25. god, it's amazing. It was it was kind of unheard of at the time. And yeah there were definitely some people who probably felt like they deserved it a little bit more and that's okay. Uh, it was, uh, well, that's okay because you, market. there's times when you feel like you deserve it and you don't get it, but you know, you put the time in. So as long as you're honest with yourself, yes, you know, that's the way life is. I mean, it's unfortunately there's one position for everyone to fight over, you know? Well, I, I put a lot of, a lot of thanks daily and Jose Eskenazi, who, who ultimately made the decision. Mike Garrett was the athletic director at the time. And, uh, and your buddy, Rich, who got you in the basketball. I mean, that, that honed your skill and got you eyes so that the next year you could transition to this. It that, was tremendous. And I, I was so fortunate and, but I, I still continue to do minor league baseball. That's the crazy thing. Mark is I did, I did uh, that season of USC women's basketball. I got a job as a number one doing more minor league baseball up in Oregon for another team. 
Okay. And then, I mean, you love it, right? I mean, it's because you love that. You, you, I think that's the passion, right? That tells you where it really totally. lies inside of you because totally. you wouldn't do minor league baseball once you hit a certain level because you don't look back. I mean, to, to go back to that just tells, speaks to your passion for it. Yeah, I did, I did minor league baseball for two more years. And just for, just for being around the guys, it was fun. It was a summer thing. Right. And you uh, built that camaraderie. I mean, there's so many benefits to that. Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I, I, I have a lot of good friends from, from those years who I'm still close with up in Oregon. So did that. And then I, I was with USC for, for eight years, eight years doing USC hoops. And, and um, boy, it was, it, there's nothing like being able to do it for your alma mater because you'll never care about another school the same way that you care about the school that you graduated from and the people that you you've met and cultivated relationships over the years and the coaching staff, those are really important things that you, you build and it's a big part, you big part of your life. For sure. So, um, yeah, I was, I was there for eight years before, before the Oklahoma city thunder, so how did this happen? So uh, tell, talk me through this little chain of events. You're you're with USC men's basketball at this point, right? Eight years in, eight years and, in, and boom! How does is an how talk me through what happened? How you got to OKC? Well, over the years with USC, I had I had sort of uh, transitioned over and done some some TV work for Pac-12 Network and Fox Sports being in Southern California and having an opportunity to do some, some games for those networks. And while you do those, you build up a reel. And the Thunder in the summer of 18 decided to transition to a new broadcaster and had an, an open position. And my agent submitted my reel to the Thunder and I think it ended up being pretty late in the process in September of 18, uh, the thunder. Wow. Started. Preseason starts in September, doesn't well, it? Or, or early, early October, October. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's kind of parallels the hockey season. Almost. This was, this was Except in early September, the thunder okay. called and, and, um, decided to fly me out for an interview. And it ended up being over the, the course of multiple days, three days. And somehow I convinced them to hire me, Mark, over that three day interview. And it was it was it was a gauntlet. I mean, it was a car wash of an interview over, I think, three, three days or so. How many people would you say you at least had some kind of interaction with during <laughs> the interview process, like it's 20, 30 it, executives? Or? It, oh, gosh, it was everybody. <laughs> and they just and threw you in the arena. Exactly. They just like, filled the arena, and made you stay in the middle, right? Basically, it was a Q and A of the lower bowl of the entire oh, wow. arena. No, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of them are my you know my friends now, and it was just like, hey, sink or swim, man, but have fun. And yeah. you're you're talking to everybody, and it was it was a it was a, an intense experience, but uh, one that I. I remember having a lot of confidence going into because of my experiences that I had to draw upon. I said to myself, look, if I, if you can get through what you've been through in your life, you can get through any kind of interview. It's not going to be bigger. It's not going to be more intimidating. It's not going to be harder to overcome. Just be yourself. Right. For sure. And if you're yourself, either they're going to like you or they're not. And you try to be as genuine as possible. You try to show them who you are as a person because there's plenty of good broadcasters out there that are very capable of doing the job and doing it extremely well. So I think that the more that you can showcase your personality, who you are, the better off you are because they're looking for a good person as much as they are looking for a good broadcaster. Yeah. Did you have an inspiration growing up? Like anybody that you always listen to, I mean, obviously you would have had your Chick Hearns and your other people, right? Growing up uh, um, in the California area. There were definitely broadcasters who impacted my style and, and had an influence on me. None other than 
John Miller, who you're probably familiar with if you watch baseball, because he was ESPN Sunday Night Baseball's broadcaster with Joe Morgan for almost two decades, if not. Oh, okay, for sure. Yeah. And John Miller was the Giants radio announcer and when, when I was growing up. And my dad and I had season tickets to the Giants, still, still have season tickets to the Giants. And we would go to the ballpark and we'd both have a headset and I would listen to John Miller and Dave Fleming call games. And he was so enthusiastic and just, you could tell that his passion for broadcasting and being at the ballpark and baseball came off in every word that he said every single day. It was so infectious. That's and cool. that was the same passion that I knew that I had going back to the day that I got hurt and it really consolidated in my mind. I want people to feel that same passion and I can feel it from John Miller. And if I can give that off to fans, hopefully they're getting something out of this experience. Yeah. One of my favorite, I mean, I'm a hockey guy. So like Doc Emmerich has always been one of my favorite play by plays guys. Uh, I grew up with Harry Callis, right? I mean, in Philadelphia, in the Phillies, Harry Callis was just amazing. Harry Callis. I, I love, love that voice. It's how to hear home run Michael (laughs) Jack Schmidt. Yeah, I we used to practice that all the time. I mean, you'll never. Was, I bet you'll never forget that World Series in 08. Never. And and I, I don't know if you knew he passed in his chair smoking a cigarette before the next bit. season started. Yeah, wow. it was like the first. I think it was opening day. I think it was opening day. He was just sitting. He slumped over in his chair in the broadcast that's, chair. That's wow. I didn't. That's know the way that. to go, right? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So. He yes, they the, didn't. They don't like, have much success. <laughs> what's that? Phillies are not a good baseball. They have the the most losses of any sports organization in the in the world. I think they so. they've had some they've had some lean years. Love their announcer now. Tom McCarthy does a great job. Yeah, uh, they're great. Tom McCarthy. He does good a good stuff, job. So. He does stuff for CBS now too. So he does an excellent yeah. job. But there's there's so many good ones. So many good ones out there. And that's um, awesome. John well, Miller. I mean, you, it's 30, 30 spots, right, in the in the NBA. So you're one of thirty. Uh, it, one nice of company. thirty. You've got thirty TV broadcasters in the NBA, thirty radio broadcasters in the NBA. Then you got thirty TV broadcasters in Major League Baseball, and thirty radio guys in Major League Baseball. For sure. The NFL so uses nothing but network guys for TV, but they do have their own individual radio guys. That's true, because we've got like Mer- Merle Reese with the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes, Merle, yeah. Merle, Merle, <laughs> forever. Look at Mark, forever. Got down. That's good. Well, I grew up with the Eagles. Merle Reese with the Eagles report. It's just good stuff. Legendary. Yeah, it's always been fun. We had like Gene Hart with hockey. You know, that was our big guy uh, growing up with. So you're a hockey guy, huh? Yeah, it's just it's. I don't know. It's Philadelphia is a very blue collar kind of town, so oh. we just work hard, play hard people. Mark, I'm telling you, there is nothing like. It's going to the Wells Fargo Center now, but oh yeah, I love going there because the fans are. I mean, they'll boo Santa Claus. We've thrown snowballs at Santa Claus. We cheered when Michael Irvin snapped his neck on the field. Oh, uh, don't say it's that. pretty yeah. bad. Yeah, it's not good. I mean, Philadelphia's got a history. They're tough. They're a tough crowd. But so. I love hearing the fans. I love hearing. Oh, it's passion. It's totally out of passion. I mean, it's it's out out of truly out of love. Uh, I love it. The city of brotherly love. Nothing but love <laughs> from the brotherly love. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> oh, I've been actually. What's interesting? I've got a funny story. I I. I'm not an Eagles fan because I went to an Eagles game against the Giants and I was at the vet, which was the old to- toilet bowl stadium. The vet yeah, stadium. stadium. And the guy, Seamus McCaffrey, who was the judge in the jail, the first ever jail in a stadium. Yes. In Philadelphia also became the state attorney general. That's how popular he became just from being the veteran stadium uh, judge. But uh, I went to a game, a guy in a, in a Rangers, New York Rangers jacket walks into a bathroom, five Eagle guys follow him in. And the dude comes out crawling out bloody. And I was scarred oh. for life. I was like eight or nine years old. Could just absolutely completely scarred for life. That's really interesting. I, tough, I, tough uh, times back then I was at, so we were in Philly last year 
on the day that they played the Seahawks in the wild card game. Okay. And I remember going to dinner after the game downtown Philly at the Capitol Grill. And I'm sitting there. Oh, and, right there on Broad Street, right? Right yeah. there in City Hall. Yeah, I know yeah. exactly where it's at. And uh, the the post, the post, I think that the the hotel was in an old post office. And I'm sitting at dinner, and these two guys who were at the game and a little buzzed are are sitting there having a hamburger at Capitol Grill, and they spent, I I shit you not, Mark, they spent two hours complaining <laughs> about Doug Peterson. And why the Eagles don't have a coach and why they can't ever do anything in the postseason and how the Eagles laid it on them. And I'm like, hey, guys, you know, you had a backup quarterback in there. You, you know, you're, you're <laughs> Josh McCown. They were not having it. <laughs> two hours, two hours of dinner. They were, they spent complaining about the, the Eagles and losing to the Seahawks it, in, the, in the postseason. So it's so crazy. I mean, look how they they won. The, it sounds crazy because of the covid feels like an extended time, but the Eagles won the Super Bowl only three years ago and they're already got rid of quarterback and head coach. I mean, it's, it seems very fickle, doesn't it? Just a little bit. (laughs) It certainly is. It certainly is. Well, I, I'm so appreciative for your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Are are there, is there anything else you wanted to share with us or anything you wanted to, any other story you wanted to share before we call it a day? My girlfriend who was just walking by, on her way out of our apartment here to go to dinner with a friend, she uh, just sent me a text and says, you have a wonderful voice. Me? Yes. Oh, well, thank you. He says, she says, she can listen to all 97 other podcasts. I, I will send her to your podcast. <laughs> she, she bets that your podcasts are fantastic. She Well, that's very podcast. kind. Thank you very much. And I, obviously you have that nice kind of boom, that voice that just carries as well. And it's definitely a broadcast voice for sure. So that's it, Mark. We're done. We're uh, well. Uh, hey, unless you want to share something else, uh, you, I always have an open invite. If you ever want to come on again, if you, I, I have two podcasts. This one's a little bit more serious. Not conscious talks about you know inspirational stories and and things like that. Loved your story. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, my other one's called Beer Googles, and it's kind of a joke on beer goggles for sure, where we just get drunk and look up random stuff on the internet. So it's like uh, the same thing, except for we find Internet stories appealing instead of women. Oh. Um, so that's always fun. So if there's ever a topic or something that comes up and you want to just have fun with it, you're welcome to come on anytime. Boy, I feel like I, I just want to I'd like to see it. Like, what, what is the stuff that you guys put out there? <laughs> it's awful. You know, I've got to uh, let me put it this way. I've got a face for radio, my friend. I've got a face for a podcast. But you've got a not, file of good clips for laughs, apparently. Not for YouTubing. Yes. Yeah. My one of my favorite jokes during the COVID time was my my uh, my impression of Tom Hanks. Can I hear? <laughs> Remember when he was the first uh, person that got infected kind of back That's in the day. Right. So That's right. it was really bad. I do really bad jokes. That's me. But we have fun with it. So every movie but, that Tom Hanks is in, he gets abandoned or is and it's crazy, right? Yeah. So, well, thank you, Chris, so much for coming on. I'm, I'm so grateful. If there's ever anything that you or your team or anybody want to share or something, I'm here to help the world. So if there's something that you think you can share with someone that can inspire people or any of your teammates or anybody, you know, in the organization, I, you know, I'm, ha- I'm here to, to help. So Fantastic. I'd be happy to promote. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. And hopefully people find it somewhat interesting. And if uh, if anybody has any questions, hit me up. Go Oklahoma City. Go Oklahoma City. For, ne- for next year, of course. Next year. We need, a, we need to get a good draft pick. <laughs> and we'll Absolutely. You got to just get that lottery pick. That's, that's, what, we we're, to go. that's what we're eyeing. But thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me on. I, I really enjoyed it. Chris, thank you again. Uh, Once again, everybody, this has been an episode of Knocked Conscious. Please subscribe, follow, rate, review. We'd love to hear from you. If there's anything, uh, you know, you you have some feedback for Chris, any draft picks you need him to tell the team to pick, feel free to send it to me and I'll be happy to forward to him. Chris, thank you again so much. Until next time, look forward to it. Until next time, have a great day. Thanks, you too. 